Well, thank you. Thank you, Beth. I'm going to have to get you the abridged version of that. Uh, everybody no, no, no. <laughs> sit through how uncomfortable that is. I think that was something that was a, sub submitted when I got to be a, a keynote at a, a at a commence commencement one time. So we we had to create the real deal there. But um, I know, you know, you read things that say the sort of the key to success is doing what you love. And I can truly say that um, I loved nursing first. I don't always tell people about the law school thing. It doesn't seem to be as popular with people. <laughs> so, uh, but my my heart really is in nursing and I'm a little bit of a clinical person. So I'm hoping I, I'm gonna, I try to not get into that side of, of our work here too much in this talk today, but I'm fortunate to have just found something that um, I do absolutely love. It's something, as you all know, it's very easy to get passionate about because the need is so great. But I met Beth on day one uh, over 20 years ago. So that's how, how long we've known each other, long enough to raise kids. So um, this has been a fabulous organization to be a part of and to see the growth over that time. And you all are contributing to that by everything that you do in um, the public with us. So I wanted to um, make sure I start off with some thank yous and also I just wanted to um, just a real heartfelt I hope everyone is doing well I know a lot of people and our volunteer they have um, particular risk around everything that's going on and certainly we all have been experiencing COVID a little bit differently depending on what's what it looks like at home or work or um, you know your various loved one risk and um, I hope that you have an experience lost close to you. My condolences if you have. I, unfortunately, we're hearing more and more, hitting, hearing how that hits so close to home from some of our team members. So I'm sure some of you have been impacted very, very personally. Um, and just wanted you to also know that when we started on the, the journey of responding to COVID that our, our volunteers and our um, particularly recipients were in the forefront of our minds with realizing how important it was to wear masks and to be a good healthcare per partner and try to keep everybody safe. Our um, the volunteers and our recipients just always hold a special place in our heart to make sure we're doing our part to keep you safe and healthy. So. Um, with that, I'm going to try to sh uh, share my screen here. I did a little bit of a PowerPoint just because I knew there was kind of a lot to talk about and um, I don't want it to be real technical or anything, but I, I didn't want to forget there's really a lot to talk about. So I did that really just so I wouldn't sort of lose track of everything that I wanted to share with you about what our journey has been and what it might look like in the future. So let me... Uh, Share my screen here. Okay, does that seem like it's worked? Beth, you guys are seeing it? Yeah, all right, okay. So, like I said, I wanted to make sure I started off with some thank yous. Um, you guys, I'm going to say it a few times, how important it is for everybody to tell their stories. Uh, the professionals really don't touch people. Uh, you know, somebody like me that has more professional connection and passion for donation. My story, as much as I um, love um, this field and the passion that all of my coworkers bring to it, that's one of the biggest gifts of this field is that um, you know, everybody is so tireless and trying to do all that we can to eliminate the weight on the waiting list, but our experience does not compare to the personal stories that our volunteers share and asking people to register to be donors. So um, we can't thank you enough for continuing to do that at all times. Also, I should when I'm listing some thank yous, I don't want to forget to say how important our partners, um, the, the, our partners like the hospitals have been through uh, COVID for us. It's really been remarkable how, um, in, how everybody has continued to keep donation of utmost importance. So we've been really fortunate that way. I'm going to, I just wanted to share with you a few of the things that we've done in response to COVID. 
And this is by no means an all inclusive list. And uh, at the end, when we do any questions, I'll also ask the staff if I've overlooked anything. This is really just kind of the highlights. And we've been, um, you know, pretty much uh, implemented our disaster plan the week of um, early March. And then March 13th was when we really was a day that we made the decision and um, said, you know, starting on Monday, nobody's going to come into the office that doesn't have to, and we really kicked up that remote work. Um, but so we, for a long time, were meeting daily our emergency planning committee. And then um, now, because it's gotten a little bit more routine, all the changes that we had to make, we have been able to meet a little bit less frequently. But I keep a timeline of all the changes that we had to make, all the things that we had to look at, and you know, just updates that we had in that process of having emergency management team moving, uh, working together. And that spreadsheet, I just took a look at it because I wanted to glance and just see if there were some big items that I was leaving off of this list to share with you all. And it has um, 236 uh, data points in it of things that we either had to change or look at. Um, it's basically a spreadsheet with 236 lines of responses that we've had to have COVID. So it's been um, in the beginning, it felt like it was many changes, changes every day changes. that we were having to look at. To look and at. Um, now it's it has been a little bit less frequent than that, but it's still an ongoing process. So we're not, um, we haven't stopped being affected by it by any means. So as I said, we initiated working from home on March 13th. At that time, we did close our offices to the to visitors. Um, we started to have to change how we responded to hospitals because we were already uh, having communication with the over 100 hospitals that we work with and they were making very rapid changes to their procedures, particularly around how many um, people were going to be on site and how to even get into the hospital. So our clinical team that responds to the hospital um, we had to do more remote work even with the hospitals and sort of reduce when we come on site to just the most essential time to do that. So we used to do a, a more kind of check-ins along the way. We have dedicated hospital development staff that work in the hospitals every day. We had to bring them remote and um, really just have those clinical people that had to show up for the work uh, at the hospital responding on site. We, um, this technology that we're using here with Teams, we weren't even really using that on a daily basis. We had it in our strategic plan to use Teams, you know, which is very suitable. Uh, some people are a little more familiar with Zoom maybe, but we've been really happy with our implementation of Teams. Our IT department did that right away, and we did not have that in our um, strategic plan to implement until the end of the year before COVID struck. So we had to um, really jump in and give, you know, over 130 employees um, access to this new technology. So something like that's not really easy to do, not to mention that we're asking people to work remote at home and a lot of that workforce came into an office every day so they didn't even really have the support to be having a laptop at home or access to a lot of our systems at home so our IT um, remarkably quickly got all of our departments up to speed that um, really made the big shift to going remote. And I don't want to forget to say that we're still remote as much as we can be. Of course, we have a lot of clinical work that's getting done 24 seven. So we do have teams that come into this facility here in Durham. I'm talking, you, talking to you from um, my office here in Durham. And um, I'm only coming in a couple days a week to try to minimize the contacts around the office. But of course, we implemented all the safe distancing and we're wearing masks all the time. I have plenty of room in this office to um, not to be able to close the door and not have a mask on and, and uh, know that nobody is going to come in contact with me. But when I go out in the hallway or go to the restroom or go to the kitchen, I put on the mask and do the frequent hand washing. Um, so we do we're and we're continuing that uh, sort of indefinitely right now until we see some signs that you know it's it's safer to relax that and we're doing that to keep our 
employees safe and also to be a very good healthcare partner because of decreasing the contacts um, that all of our employees have also going out to the other essential workers out in the hospitals. So we right away started screening our staff for symptoms and any vendors that come on site in temperature taking and um, the list of symptoms and having everybody sign in so that we if we did have any kind of exposure, we were going to be able to do the contact tracing and even this was not the easiest um, transition to make because at the time it was actually really difficult to get our hands on some thermometers and then it was interesting you know um, until we were able to get our hands on some thermometers we were asking our staff to monitor their symptoms at home and um, things like that very early on and then it was just interesting as so many of our employees if they really haven't gone through having children or you know particularly that younger workforce they really didn't even have thermometers at home so there was this brief time where everybody was uh, just kind of doing that the best they could do because of the supplies being so um, low but that was all very early on and before there were even requirements to do some of the screening so um, of course we've had to keep abreast of all of the um, state and local government enforcements that are going on in all of the areas um, that we work in and that was an ongoing challenge on a day-to-day -day basis um, in the beginning as well. We did um, really, uh, Chuck, you, who, all, who you all know, um, did a great job of making sure that we were communicating with staff as frequently and updating them um, very frequently about the rapid changes. We were having town halls very frequently and sending out um, regular communications. And at one point we stopped and surveyed the staff to make sure that they were getting their needs met in communication and in supplies and things like that. And we're, I was really proud of our implementation team because we overwhelmingly had um, very, very positive response on that. Our employees felt like they knew what was going on. We were being very transparent about what we thought the impact of the virus was going to be to us. You know, there was a lot of uncertainty in the beginning, so we didn't even really know if we would be um, able to continue to have access in the hospitals, if tissue donation was going to continue. Um, with all that uncertainty, we, we, um, just try to keep them up to date as we learned more information and uh, learn more about the virus really. We did um, distribute PPE to our staff very early on. Um, they, you know, the hospitals, We everybody probably remembers those headlines from back in March and April where PPE, uh, for one thing, do we know what PPE was? It wasn't exactly a household term, I don't think, before COVID, and now everybody knows what PPE is. Um, but there were concerns about whether um, the hospital was going to be able to share their supplies with our staff coming into the hospital. So um, we made sure that everybody had what they needed, and then we um, also set in up some um, some processes to make sure we were ordering and tapping into some of the um, state stockpile and things like that. We also, even before um, masks were really kind of widely starting to be used and required by anybody, we did um, place an order with um, uh, somebody that was making the masks and then um, offered to send masks out to the households of all of our staff to make sure that um, everybody had something that they felt safe in. And then again, that when we weren't needing the medical PPE, that people were wearing the appropriate, appropriate sort of social masks out and about, if they had to be out and about. We try to encourage people to do that as, as little as possible. Um, of course, the um, safety of our team was of utmost concern. It was just right up there with making sure that we could continue our mission. We were very, very concerned that, um, you know, if you, it's it's hard to go back and think of those early days, but when there was so little known, um, you know, just to make sure that our staff was um, gonna be safe from COVID positive patients in the hospital, we knew right away that um, we were not going to be pursuing COVID positive donors. So we wanted to make sure that our staff did not have any unnecessary exposure to that population. Um, we also, the availability of supply was one of the, the challenges for us and some supplies really, we do have to keep a quite 
um, a close eye on and try to make sure that we're keeping up long term par levels. I don't think we really ever dipped below um, in most of our key supplies that we dipped below about a three month supply um, of the essential things, but we did have some times where we were concerned about the hand gel and um, hand sanitizer and things like that for safety around here. So we had some some um, really having to scurry. We had to bring on a whole new additional supplier because our um, original supplier that while we were very happy with their services, just that supply and demand and, you know, some of uh, some of the, you know, how how uh, levels just got low on some of those real essential supplies. We did experience some of that that you um, have probably heard on the news and things like that. Um, one of our biggest challenges after we were kind of operating in a little a, a little while underneath these new circumstances, it really became apparent to us that um, that the family members of the donors or potential donors that we were talking to, we really felt like uh, um, they were very stressed out because um, maybe some of you all experienced about how restricted it is if you have somebody in the hospital there was a time where um, there may not even be a visitor at the bedside i think around here the hospitals have for the most part allowed a visitor now but there was a period of time when there really weren't visitors or family members not all hospitals were consistent about if the family was at end of life um, if they were having to make decisions or if they knew that, you know, is anticipated that they were going to lose their loved ones, there still were oftentimes not exceptions to those circumstances. So we were having to talk to families um, strictly over the phone for, you know, uh, quite a period of time there. And um, we still are talking to families more on the phone than we were doing before COVID. Um, but we really had to respond. That's an example of something that we really had to respond to and um, try to impact that um, situation as much as much as we could. And our our staff has done a lot of um, advocating for um, the families that we're working with and see if there's a way to be able to engage in person with them, whether it be um, outside, you know, off of the unit of the hospital or um, something, you know, more in. Um, even a chapel or something like that to try to advocate for them being able to have that in-person um, contact because we really felt like those families were suffering even in addition to the loss that we see them experience on a routine basis around the donor process. We really were seeing them so very disconnected from what was going on with their loved one and um, really impacting whether they felt confident that their loved one was getting the appropriate care and things like that. So our staff had to do a lot of advocating and um, the hospitals have all gotten to a place in many instances where some of those restrictions have been reduced and then uh, most of them partner with us pretty well in trying to for those very difficult end of life conversations to try to um, do what we can to have in-person contact with them and try to soften any restrictions they can for for that as one of the few exceptions that that happens. Um, we also, Paul, many of you I'm sure have the impact of children not being in school and the child care closures. So our staff on, you know, in addition to really being an essential worker and having to navigate doing their work in this new environment, they also have been dealing with um, being teachers at home and trying to juggle those responsibilities, you know, even with a spouse. Of course, some people don't have um, that kind of support of another spouse or other family members. So um, we really tried to do what we could in those areas where we could be flexible and support the families that were navigating um, school. We did have a lot of um, feedback from the staff on this issue and we continue to because it does seem like the you could almost hear this collective like sigh of relief when the school year ended and and people could go back to um, just kind of parenting with the kids around and not having to navigate the school, although not even that has been easy, I know. Um, but then um, with the schools gearing up again, we are um, in that position again of we tried to anticipate some of what their needs would be and just understand that and and offer the flexibility um, for employees to be able to manage the school and the childcare with um, how different that looks right now. 
And of course, you know, really in the early times, I think I alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, we really didn't know whether transportation was going to continue because we saw in some of the areas that really were heavily hit that um, particularly New York, I think there, there was a time probably where a lot of you were seeing just devastating images on the nightly news about what was going on with healthcare and the hospitals being over capacity and ventilator concerns. Um, so we really didn't know at, you know, at one point whether um, transplantation would be able to continue, whether the hospitals would have the capacity to do that, whether how they were going to manage the risk of making those decisions for their recipients about the risk of having a potential exposure in a COVID um, environment versus the need of transplantation. And then, of course, the result of um, not having a life saving transplant. So. Um, there was, I think that on this slide, you see the word uncertainty or uncertainty. Yes. And I, I feel like that, that really was the, the term that just kind of captured everything going on with COVID in um, those first few weeks and months was that there was so much uncertainty about what everything was going to look like, how safe people were going to um, be and whether transplantation and donation was going to um, continue and um, be able to operate with how taxed some hospitals might get. Um, we also pretty early on, um, because of some of the professional guidance with our partner organizations, we did move to uh, making a decision that every donor should be tested for COVID-19. And um, when I think back to um, March and April, I, I think, you know, if we could clock how many hours uh, some of the folks on leadership spent in trying to communicate with the various entities that were trying to set up testing and whether they were going to be able to take on our donor population. It was um, hours and hours of every day of trying to figure out um, having a, a suitable uh, mechanism to test the donors and then also get the results back timely because I'm sure if any of you have been tested, it's, it has not been unusual to wait um, five days, even, you know, sometimes it's been as long as 10 days, certainly in the early phase, it was that long. And there really weren't local labs that were um, that were in a position to be able to do donor testing where we would have the results on a suitable time frame because our, you know, our process of evaluating a donor and having um, results back is usually, you know, about 24 hours before we're we're moving towards trying to get those organs transplanted. So um, doing the procurement and getting organs transplanted. So it was um, quite the task of trying to find a lab. And then um, we started a partnership with um, a lab that we were used to and had to send the, um, the testing out of state for a while. So that added a lot of delays. And that was on top of having transportation issues of flights decreased and, you know, difficulty of getting the sample where it needed to go. So um, there was a lot of urgency over getting donor testing. And um, now we have multiple choices with the donor testing. It happens timely, um, but it really took a lot of um, effort and having um, conversations to get there. So what has happened with transplantation in the United States um, in light of all this? So um, the green line, the green line in the top chart there is 2020 and the blue line is 2019. And the top um, chart shows you the total number of transplants year to date. So from January um, through now approximately. And you can see that the beginning of the year started off where um, 2020 was right in line with the transplant activity last year. And then um, after February into early March, it actually was higher than last year's number of transplants. And then you can see where after April, it crossed um, the green line crossed on the bot over the the bottom, so to speak, of the 2019 number. So you can see that um, the numbers are below where they were last year for transplants, but not far, um, not vastly different, I would say. And I wanted to show you 
the what really is dramatic if you look in that in the bottom left where you can see that it's the living donor transplants that really dropped off um, around the time of COVID uh, hitting in March and beyond. So it makes sense that the transplant centers were not able to bring in living donors in this environment and um, transplant those organs, per, um, primarily kidneys, to recipients. And then the, the next to that, you see the deceased donor transplants. So when you look at the whole picture and see that we're just a little bit below um, last year's activity, it really has been the deceased donor volume that has been um, kind of made up the difference, so to speak. So um, I'm sure everybody is wondering how did CDS do in the big picture of things with all those challenges that I mentioned earlier and all those process changes we had to make. Um, how are we doing? Would we get uh, green for good, yellow for eh, kind of middle of the road, or um, the red sad face, meaning there is a lot of uh, opportunity for um, change or improvement there? So here's pretty much the same table that you were just looking at with the national numbers. Um, this is our numbers, though. So you can see, um, again, the uh, green line is 2020 and you can see that in the beginning of the year we kind of started off neck and neck with our activity last year and I'm sure um, all of you have probably seen through our announcements and social media that last year was a record-breaking year for us and now um, you can see here the green line is well above 2019 numbers so we're really really grateful to say that we um, continued to operate. Uh, we never really missed a beat and that um, amazingly we are ahead of last year's organ donor activity. So um, on the left there is the number of organ donors that we've had year to date and you can see that those the actual numbers are there at the bottom. We've had 192 organ donors and at this time last year we had 162. So we're 30 ahead of where we were last year. And then when you look at the organs transplanted, which of course that's really the important number is how many patients are getting their transplants. You can see that again, the green line outpaces last year's blue line. And at this time last year, we had 500 organs transplanted and um, year to date this year, we're at 573, so 73 more organs transplanted than this time last year. And um, we are so grateful when I think of all that uncertainty that we had in March and April and, um, you know, just just, um, you know, concerned that we weren't going to be able to get into the hospitals, that the hospitals weren't going to have capacity to keep transplanting. Um, that we have been able to continue to fulfill our mission like this and that we've had a team that has um, remained healthy and safe and um, extremely motivated and supportive of our, our mission. We're really, really proud of that. And it also speaks to a lot of the partnerships in this area because not every place in the country really looks like this. Um, I think it's also a big testament to the commitment that our local transplant centers had. Now, not all of our organs stay um, local, but around here, they we had conference calls with all the transplant centers early on. We all got on together to try to figure out what we could do together to make sure that transplantation and donation was going to continue. And um, I heard that loud and clear from them that they needed us to continue to operate because they fully intended to continue to take care of their transplant patients. So um, we really do have world class transplant centers um, that we're very proud to be in part partnership with around here. And again, I'm sure um, many of you feel that way from um, some of the, the transplants um, or your personal connections, perhaps to um, your transplant teams. So what what do I think we'll say looking back? You know, I know um, I think it's, it's kind of a dark slide. I think the image of the rear view mirror with COVID in, and I think, you know, probably COVID has been a very dark experience for all of us. 
Um, we look forward to the day that that is long behind us in our rearview mirror. I know that we're not there yet, um, but what I hope that we can say is that these unprecedented times led to unprecedented progress. And I don't mean to diminish the seriousness of COVID or the loss that people are experiencing, um, but I do think that when we're really challenged through times like this, there are opportunities to get stronger from it. And that is certainly um, my approach and um, one that I think our team has really um, tried to embrace. So when we look at what the path ahead might look like, you know, of course, you kind of have to have your eyes wide open to both the dangers and the opportunities. So, um, you know, one one path might go sort of down a hill and into a dark place and another one up and, uh, you know, sort of uh, more of the right direction, perhaps. So we definitely want to um, be, have our eyes open to both um, entities of the future, what could be dangerous and what could be some opportunities. So some of the opportunities really here specifically at CDS that I'm seeing is um, certainly we have been shocked by how successful we have been with the remote work. Now that does affect all of our departments differently because as I said, some of the clinical folks um, really are still coming in um, to do their job in the, either in the hospitals or in our procurement areas. Um, but even some of that work is um, if they are supporting the process, um, you know, through maybe organ allocation, we used to have um, somebody maybe on site doing more of that, and we've made some components of that even more remote than it was. So um, I do think that we are seeing a lot of wins there and will definitely work to be a more flexible organization around where work gets done in the future. And of course, there's there's benefits to that. I think a lot of people do find more balance from the combination of um, losing their work commute and um, you know just being in a more comfortable space. And then of course, it also brings us that benefit of being able to recruit for positions without having a particular geographic boundary in mind. Um, that's certainly not to say that it's perfect because I know, you know, we hear repeatedly that the remote work um, might have been a little more enjoyable if the kids weren't hanging around at home with us or even, you know, needing so much with school. So it's not ideal for everybody and we really do want that just kind of flexibility to be able to match with employees what what works for them to um, feel productive and balanced between their work and all of their other commitments in their life. So um, I think our whole team has kind of embraced trying to stop, uh, step back and look at what does that look like for the future to us. Um, of course, uh, you know, some of the sort of uh, crazy changes are, um, you know, that I didn't even really put in here, but that you kind of hear and various places is how even our dress and our attire is changing because of all the work home, you know, going from professional dress to, um, you know, showing up to Zoom calls and Teams meetings just in your hoodie and stuff like that. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how some of those um, smaller changes really change our future. And then, you know, you consider the um, what's the future of the handshake and things like that. Um, but I think we are going to have to also be embracing more technology and innovation. It kind of forced us there um, a little bit earlier than we planned to, and that's really turned out to be a good thing. So um, there's lots of innovations and technology to take advantage of to try to sort of compensate for what some of our losses are. Um, you know, for an example, I, I have mentioned on here that we're having less travel and less in-person gathering, and we really don't know when that is going to change. Um, so, you know, what are the other, um, what are some gaps that we can fill by using technology different, whether it's, you know, finding out how to be more social with each other through these mechanisms, or, um, you know, if we're not showing up to an event in person, then is there a different way to, 
to do some of that networking. That's an important part of what we all do and the relationship building or the visibility, you know, does um, we're traveling less. So do we need to take some of what we used to spend on travel and use it uh, differently in innovation or in, you know, having to advertise differently within a meeting to make sure that we're getting the visibility that we were driving for in person um, connections. So those are all things that we're going to have to look at differently um, for for the time being. Um, and I know that really impacts um, the the CRCs that you all work with because their day to day life has really changed perhaps more than anybody in our organization because they have been out in the community, um, you know, leading educational events, working on a lot of relationship building. And I know they're um, really stepping back and rethinking how you can still have a lot of those important engagements with it not being face to face. Um, we also, I think, um, when I think of COVID and it, it is in the rear view mirror, I don't think I'm going to be thinking of it being just COVID anymore. I think I'm going to think of it as it all is kind of happening um, at one time. Some of the social unrest that we are experiencing, some of the impact of being in an election year. It's really been um, a lot to deal with at one time. And I think um, that that's why I really wanted to add in here that we have an opportunity to embrace some of the dialogue that is happening as a result of those things. And that, uh, you know, I, I kind of wrap some of our opportunities around um, increased and improved conversations and changes around diversity and inclusion. Also, you know, it, it's, it's happening at the same time as COVID. So I just am sort of including that in the future uh, what things are going to look like after COVID and sort of some of being new and improved and better is um, a big piece of the um, diversity and inclusion and work that needs to be done around that. I do um, one. I have continuous process improvement in here as far as our opportunities, and I think we already had a very strong culture around that. It really comes with um, this this important work that we do, as long as there's deaths on the waiting list, we always have to be striving to be doing more and doing better. Um, so uh, that is definitely something that's going to have to continue for us. But we really are rethinking how we do things entirely. It's not um, just little pieces here and there. It's really causing us to look at um, sort of a whole new world. And I really I'm proud of, I feel like our team has really embraced taking this time to do that. Um, and there's some of those, the impact of some of those things I already mentioned, like less travel and um, less meeting in person. So the challenges with all the, some of those challenges are really almost the same thing, right? Like the less engagement in person and how we connect with people. Um, so one of the, you know, really important things that we are trying to be prepared for is more emotional support and resources to our employees. They really, these are very difficult times and they do very difficult work. It's already very emotionally draining work. Um, so we really need to be um, poised to be able to continue to support. We do have lots of parents on our staff that are teachers, but um, you know, I'm also learning that the grandparents that work here and the aunties that work here and, you know, even maybe to some extent friends and families are really part of that community trying to support the kids learning at home. So to the capacity that we're um, able to not only support with flexibility, but do our part with a strong EAP program or um, whatever we can do to just help employees have that um, balance or at least work not be contributing to the increased stress that everybody is feeling. Um, I think it's going to be very important for our future. And I think um, while it's a lot right now, I think that that should become a permanent culture shift that lands us all in a lot better place. I know for me, one of the silver linings of COVID has been 
the all of the restrictions and the things that we lost and uh, have lost and that we're missing um, in some ways the simplicity from that or the being intentional about priorities of what stays and what goes and what am I still doing um, some of that I feel you know does give us that balance for the future so I'm hoping that we have an environment where um, we're supporting employees to um, you know, be supported and have um, resources for a healthy future, both at home and at work. Um, you know, as an organization and as a field, I think we really have to be prepared for the economic impact. There's going to be a lot of um, reforms as a consequence of everything going on around us with um, COVID and the resources that are needed. So it's something that um, we're going to have eyes really um, open to how those things might impact us and I have a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, it's also an opportunity to be advocating for positive regulatory impact and I know um, I think you you all have already gotten some messages from us about some changes um, potential changes going on and an opportunity to advocate with us. Um, so we are um, with the um, we, we with our um, professional association are trying to um, get some support in communicating our concerns with a proposed um, some proposed changes to the organ procurement um, certification metrics and if they there was a draft that came out in um, response to the um, executive order on kidney health that's where um, the the president charged Department of Health and Human Services to work on the OPO performance metrics and what got published in December um, could really dramatically impact donation and really destabilize um, the organ donation system unless they take the feedback that um, that was they asked for. There was um, a public comment period that we contributed to and have expressed our concerns and continue to do so. Um, but now we're we're um, joining in a letter writing campaign to try to get some um, positive change in the um, the final rule of the OPO metrics so that they are published in a way that does not um, throw our system into a lot of chaos. So I think last week probably you all got a message from either Beth Taylor or Latoya about joining the advocacy um, campaign. So I just really ask you to take action with that and um, consider joining that effort for us so we can all speak to our legislators and make sure that um, the changes all really genuinely drive for um, a meaningful process improvement and not bring undue um, chaos into the system. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that at the end and show you the website where you can do that. Um, so the opportunity is kind of collective, everybody in donation and transplantation. Um, I think we're already sensing that there's a lot of opportunities for increased collaboration with our partners, whether that be um, transplant centers, whether it be um, with the hospitals to really look at our um, processes and see if there's some efficiencies that can be gained. Um, one of the things that we're experiencing because of the risk of teams traveling and trying to reduce that, um, there has been a, a national effort that the teams that go and travel to procure the organs and bring them back to their recipients, that that travel be reduced and the local team take on the burden of that or the, the um, responsibility of that in the local donor scenario and then the organs then get um, sent to the teams waiting in other areas. So um, that's something that one of those positive changes that in our area COVID kind of forced and it's working extremely well. So um, that's a, one of those examples of something that we really don't want to go back uh, to the old way because there are so many benefits to um, having the teams travel less. And then um, also with that, there's opportunities because organs um, do travels um, and sometimes need to go even um, you know we're, we're pushing the limits all the time on how far away that recipient can be that's going to be the best match for an organ so there's a lot of um, 
organ preservation technologies, organs that go on a pump to um, really continue the um, preservation of the organs and maximize how they're going to function in a recipient. So this time is really um, bringing to light a lot of potential there to make transplants better from these technologies. Um, I think that all of us are going to have to anticipate in the um, federal response to reform and um, that you know, the priorities sound like there's going to be, of course, a lot of focus on making emergency preparedness better. It's also, um, you know, because of the cost in the economy right now, a lot of things in reimbursement are going to change. So I think we just need to be prepared for um, any of that and just know if there's going to be not all of these things impact donation and transplantation, but sometimes they can have a consequence because they're also interrelated. So I think we just need to stay abreast of these things going on. Um, there's certainly going to be a focus on long term care um, because of the impact that we've seen that environment have with COVID and that um, as they make reforms in that area that they don't have a negative impact on the importance and the attention and the resources that donation and transplantation have is going to be very, very important. Um, and then, of course, um, all of us, I think, really um, have a responsibility to be advocating and in some cases um, uh, educating about how the disparities in healthcare that are um, based on the um, race issues or socioeconomic issues that we are communicating about how we see that impact in donation and transplantation and to be a part of the change to um, to have progress in that area and also um, to minimize the impact that um, these issues have. They really I think any of you that have gone through training with us know that medical mistrust issues are the number one reason that people say no to being an organ donor and the health, the disparities and the treatment that um, people have experienced for generation after generation, I think definitely contribute to that. and. Um, we certainly are talking about that more and um, the, the time definitely seems right to um, see some progress in eliminating those things. So how can you help? As I said earlier, I really um, want to express to you how important it is that you continue to tell your um, story, why you have passion about organ donation and ask people to register and be donors. And then um, you're, we are going to follow up today with the advocacy email that I mentioned earlier, and you will see that there are just some really simple click throughs that um, you can send off three letters to your um, to your legislators by just um, probably does not take any more than two minutes, literally, and it's up to you if it you know, a form letter will be generated and you just send it and there is an opportunity to add your story if you want to to that. So I really would appreciate if all of you can um, look into that and, and hopefully do that for us. And then um, with that, I do again want to thank you not only for joining us today, but for um, being um, so engaged with us and continuing to tell your story. And please know that your stories and the need for organ donation and people like you are what inspires our team, um, especially during difficult times of COVID. They, um, our team was just amazing about how they wanted to make sure the mission continued and their first concern really did not seem to be about their safety. They were uh, more concerned about donation continuing and then also about the safety of their colleagues that they know from the hospitals that work in those intensive care units that they felt like were, you know, the bedside providers of the COVID cases and whether they were going to stay um, safe. So. This team has inspired me as well during this time, and I'm I'm very proud of them. And I think we've lost left some time for questions or comments or anything. My, our team would add to anything I've said here.